Next speaker is Stas Smirnov, who will talk about the, the title you can see here, SLE Percolation and Scaling Limits. So it's, it's a great honor to speak here, and I uh, greatly admired uh, Adzet and his, his mathematics. Uh, uh, and um, well, of course, most of my mathematical connections with Adet were through uh, percolation and SLE, though uh, almost of interaction at least. Though, of course, uh, before I've uh, read his circle packing papers and uh, the complex analysis stuff. And I was trying uh, to remember last week when I first heard about SLE. So actually I realized that I first heard from Tatiana who returned from a conference where Adet was speaking I think about force in higher dimensions but he then said that in dimension two there is this approach with Lovner. So I tried to Google, actually that was before Google, okay, I tried to search on the web uh, and the only thing I found was a research proposal on his web page. So it was still 98, which, which uh, says at the end that I intend to try to prove that my construction indeed describes the loop erased random walk scaling limit. Uh, so uh, I tried to, since there was no text, I tried to reverse engineer from this what an SLE is. And I, I still kind of regret that I wasn't able to, to do it nicely. So I had, I had to wait till, till the paper appeared sometime later. So that was one, one year later. And that was actually uh, one of sort of my nicest experience in reading papers. It's you, you kind of feel like uh, uh, putting together a jigsaw puzzle and there are these pieces which seem uh, like from different worlds. They are completely different and suddenly like everyone clicks together. And this, this, this was certainly uh, I'm actually very envious. It, it's, it must have been a very nice experience to invent a silly just the moment you realize how this all come together, this all very different things. Uh, and uh, and then, then shortly thereafter, the first papers of uh, Greg and Wendelin and Odette, and, that, that, and th then I actually understood that it's, this is going to be a very exciting thing. And uh, I actually remember, because Odette was always sort of a humble person, I remember that I, when I first realized that how excited I'm about this, this was in this first SLE conference in Strasbourg, I said to Adet, wow, it's so nice. And it's, it's, it's just thank you very much for this great experience. And now, and I was trying to understand what the conformal field theory is at that moment. Well, I'm sort of still trying. But uh, I said, well, it seems that we now finally have the but you need to understand it all. And this thing of yours, it will describe all of it. I said, oh, no, no, I'm not so ambitious. It should give like percolation and loop erased random walk, but maybe uniform spanning tree, but not much, much more. And I said, no, but it's, it sort of should. I mean, your lemma, it applies. He said, he thought for a like, few minutes, he said, oh, yeah, indeed it does. <laughs> <laughs> and that, 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 that was actually uh, very nice. And um, uh, so pe 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 people were saying uh, a few things about how he did mathematics. So I kind of my, my main um, impression that he always had um, this sort of two qualities that he posed the correct questions and he uh, brought the correct tools, which is very visible with the CLE, but it's, it's also in, uh, in many of other his contributions. So he starts with some question other people post and then he modifies it. Uh, and it then makes much more sense. Uh, and uh, so it was like with the CLE, so you can, uh, so I will try to speak about the scaling limits, uh, uh, how it's said in the title, and uh, he actually made, so this was in my, so from my viewpoint, one half of his great contribution that he posed the correct question. He took uh, this very nice object, a random curve, and it's, uh, first, it's, it's not too much, it's not the whole field theory. So it's, it's kind of you can touch with your hands. But on the other hand, it apparently already carries all the information. Uh, and then he brought in correct tools, the Lovner revolution. So, so people were uh, saying that he reinvented it. So I, I, I think he, he told me that actually he kind of he knew working in complex analysis about it, but he never thought about it in this connection. And then he was uh, thinking about uh, these perimeters composing uh, random maps, and then actually you immediately get that there are random maps which you compose, and the first two coefficients are additive, so you immediately come 
to a fact that if you have this Markov property, then the first coefficient will be a Brownian motion. And then, uh, uh, so we don't need Lovner theorem for that. You need Lovner theorem to say that if you know behavior of the first coefficient, you know everything. And so he said that he like, observed it, and then he thought that I must have seen this somewhere. And, and then I'm, and I think he was still in Jerusalem, so there was a library. So he went and he discovered the papers of, of Lovner, and, uh, but I'm sure without Lovner he would have uh, reinvented it anyway. Uh, and um, so people were saying that uh, he kind of always liked uh, to invent his own proofs. So uh, actually I think it, it, it wasn't sort of a kind of, I don't know, arrogant thing or something. It's, it's more like he wanted to have a hands-off of feeling of the subjects. And uh, he preferred uh, having some proof which doesn't use some esoteric machinery. You don't have to read long books, but instead uses geometric intuition and that he well, much more, but it doesn't mean that they were like simple using simple technology. Usually, it was sort of hands-on and maybe down to earth. Well, still in some sense is down to earth, uh, but it's it's sort of with some interesting twist, uh, and uh, it, it it was not not uh, not necessarily with the uh, proofs. Uh, so I, I I remember that like many many of us used his pictures or his computer programs. So I remember that first time I used. His program, I need the picture of percolation, so I use this, uh, this picture. Let me maybe scroll a little bit. Uh, so it's a PS file. So uh, what, 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 what he did is that uh, he used that the PostScript is a uh, full scope programming language. So this is actually a small program in PostScript, uh, which, uh, so, so this is just a small part of it. This is how, how it works. There are some routines. So in PostScript, you have if operators, you have loops. So you see, for example, this is uh, for exploring the perimeter rotation left, rotation right, and he draws the random thing. And then the nice twist which he has here is that he didn't want to sort of, uh, he wanted to have, well, if, if you ever needed a picture for percolation paper of something which happens almost surely, you know that usually you have to test it 10 times before almost surely actually happens and you get a picture which looks generic. So here. <laughs> So he had this routine picture which would produce picture, and that and then there was a common loop. So what happens if, if you run this file, uh, if you press page, well, it's one page file, but if you press page down, uh, oops. Okay, so if you press page down, it just enters this loop, and it produces a new picture. You press page down, it produces a new one. It produces a new one. So I didn't know that, and I needed a picture for, for a talk, expository talk, so I sent it to the printer and went off to lunch. <laughs> and... Uh, well, the printer also is a full-fledged computer. It has a processor, which understands post-scripting language. So when I returned back a, a year, no, not a year, sorry, an hour and a half later, I, I discovered that uh, our system manager was very upset because he several times tried to stop it. But, I mean, Unix was resending it back. And there was, you know, this big printer, like a Xerox machine, which has a, a, a few boxes full of paper. <laughs> so what I had afterwards, I, I had about... Uh, like 2,000 pictures like that, and I had to do something with them. Uh, actually, that was very nice because I, I always could easily just find a picture uh, to illustrate any phenomenon, and uh, well, which has probability more than one in a thousand, and I use them as a scrap paper. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah okay. So this is uh, no, but but then actually I deleted this loop thing because it turned out to be a bit counterproductive. So. Uh, so the other thing is, is uh, so as, as I remember, Adet, he was always a very positive and very upbeat. And uh, I just un understood, uh, preparing yesterday, that of all my memories of him, well, ex except for this terrible day a year ago, all are very, very positive. So it's what was Wendelin saying. So I decided to show some pictures, two last pictures I found in my mobile phone. So this was at the World Wolfsburg meeting a year ago, and we had a midnight seminar about the future of SLE. And uh, being a bit, well, so Adet is laughing. Uh, well, I won't say the complete story, but uh, one of us made a statement that SLE is the most ridiculous thing he has ever seen. And uh, then Adet uh, turned to me, looking for help, and said, but it describes, say, scaling limit of percolation. And the answer was, well, but percolation is even more ridiculous. <laughs> So this is what he's laughing about, and we, ha we had actually a wonderful discuss discussion there. And then the last time I, s I saw him was a year 
ago in Montreal, and he was also sort of very upbeat and happy. Actually, it's not visible in this picture, but he, ha he had this, uh, this uh, thing on his head. It's like uh, from a biker's costume with the flames and crossed bones. And he was sort of explaining that, you know, a friend presented to me, and I, I, I have to wear something on my head. I'm a bit, uh, well. So that, that was a very, very nice conference. And uh, actually, uh, Stefan and I and Kari Asta were organizing a sort of SLE conference, which goes a bit wider this year in May. So we'll probably put together a web page and uh, send an advertisement next week. Uh, so those of you who are interested in SLE or related things uh, with Logner Falls, please, please come. Or those who are not yet interested, please get interested. Mm -hmm. So it's an uh, ETH Zurich Conference Center, which is in Swiss Italian Alps. So it's, it's a view, view from that, that place. So it's like an Oberwolf, but in the mountains. Uh, so, uh, so the title, I, now I, I think I'll switch to the blackboard. Uh, so uh, I, I will be discussing scaling limits of percolation, and we were discussing them with audit on and off for like about eight, nine years. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, this is what, what Wendelin mentioned, that when audit was writing papers alone, he put more personal comments in them, and in email he even put more personal comments. So this is what he thought about the the scaling limit. Uh, I, I like actually su 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 some touches uh, that I'm not sure that we have, I have the foresight to decide on the definition now, but maybe we should attempt it for otherwise who knows what will happen. <laughs> uh, and um, the thing is that uh, I am not, uh, I don't think, well, as, as he writes, I don't think we have an ideal definition for the scaling limits because in part it depends on what you want to do with it. Maybe. Uh, you want to connect it to few theories, so maybe you want to do some noise sensitivity things of Fourier spectrum like uh, Christophe and Gaber uh, are doing, uh, we're doing with that, uh, or, or maybe you want to calculate the dimensions. So, uh, so I don't think, I, I still, I mean, that, that he wrote a few years ago, probably four or five years ago, but I, do, I, do, I don't think uh, we actually have a, uh, an optimal definition now. So I, I will be discussing one possible definition, and it's sort of a joint work uh, with Odette, uh, which, which is for one specific problem, uh, for, for one sort of noise sensitivity. And uh, I want just to add uh, one thing I like about SLE, it's not even the sort of it gives a definition of the scaling limit, but that more that it's sort of hands-on. You can, it's, it's very nice to prove things with. So it's really maybe more important not as a definition, but as, as a tool. Uh, and uh, if, 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 uh, if you want other definitions, it can be used to do other definitions as well. So uh, now I think I'll take, I'll put this thing up. Ah, wow, it has intelligence of its own. Uh, so, uh, so it starts, uh, so I, 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 I will uh, sort of discuss a theorem which uh, can be essentially stated that uh, percolation in the plane is a black noise. And uh, someone already mentioned the, the word noise uh, here, but not giving a definition. So it's, uh, uh, so I'm not going to give a definition of a black noise. I, I will say a bit uh, what is noise. So it starts with the work of Cyrilson and Verschik. Uh, uh, so you, you, there, there are, there are uh, two or three expository papers by Cyrilson, which I highly recommend. Uh, uh, so one, uh, one of them is his talk at the ICM, which ha is half about it, and uh, the other one, there are two versions, probability surveys and Sunflower School, it's the same volume as Wendelin's uh, course about SLE, where he dis discusses the, what, what is, is a noise, and in his language, essentially, noise is a continuous product uh, of probability spaces. So he mostly works with the spaces indexed by a line, so you assume that uh, you have a, let's say, uh, space uh, omega with the sigma algebra f and some probability measure mu. And then there are sigma algebras f uh, indexed by real numbers uh, with the property that uh, f is the limit of those algebras if t goes to minus infinity, s goes to plus infinity. Then these uh, algebras f, t, s, a translation invariant, uh, um, and also that uh, if you take algebra T R, uh, 
then it's it's a sum uh, of algebras T S and S R. So it's uh, ever, um, uh, no, I don't remember. Okay, let me use this. So F uh, S R. So so one thing you can think about is the white noise that that would certainly. So it's 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 kind of a, a random object indexed by a line, which is kind of infinitely divisible and translationally invariant. So, so uh, the obvious example is white noise, uh, but uh, what they did, uh, they uh, uh, constructed some more interesting noises, uh, which uh, uh, Tritzelson calls black uh, noise, uh, because uh, so his, his motivation is that uh, uh, the, the white noise spectrum is constant, so you see all frequencies, and that's, that's the white color, and black noise, you don't see any frequencies, so there is no linear response, so we have to have some more difficult machinery to, to detect it. So I don't go into exact definition. You can read the Cerison's papers. It's a, it's, it's a very nice uh, experience. And um, so they, they construct some example use, use, using the, the Brown and the Webb. And um, so there is an original paper of Cerison and Vershek, and then there are some papers of Cerison. And the questions uh, they, they uh, ask there is whether you have some object of this type indexed not by real line, but by a plane. So of course you, you can do white noise on the plane, so you can have white noise on the plane, but okay, you have uh, uh, more complicated noises indexed by a plane. And the, the canonical sort of uh, uh, so uh, other interesting examples, interesting <coughs> examples on a plane. So what, what you would supposed to be having there instead of this property is that if you have two, so here there are two disjoint intervals and the sum of sigma algebra is sigma algebra for the bigger interval. So uh, you should have, uh, if you have two domains, say you cut domain D um, into two parts, D plus and D minus, you would want to have a property that FD is the sum of FD plus and FD minus. <coughs> Uh, and uh, so uh, I think that Sirison asked this question in this sunflower school, whether you can get uh, such a thing from percolation. So in percolation, certainly uh, you would have, uh, uh, if you construct some scaling limit of percolation, you would have this property translation invariance because any reasonable well, the model is translationally invariant. And then uh, you would have the property that the percolation picture in whole plane, you can exhaust it by domains. So the uh, the main question, if, if you have a percolation picture in some domain and you cut it in half, whether, whether you can reconstruct the whole picture. And uh, the, there, are, there are, of course, potential difficulties. So um, the potential difficulties are, I, I don't know, it's, it's not visible if I write that law. Or what, where, where is the line where, under which it's not visible? It's OK? Or I should it even write higher? That line is OK. O OK, so, so, what, what, uh, so the potential difficulty is that there is some information stored on this line. So, uh, so basically, there are, there are two questions. One question is uh, uh, how would you define sigma algebra f? So what is the percolation configuration? Because there were several definitions proposed in the, in the terms of like sets of all curves as crossings, sets of uh, all interfaces. Uh, you, you can do some height functions also for, for percolation. And the second thing is that how to prove that there is no information supported on the line. So now, uh, so we asked not to get technical. Now I'll get technical. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that, that, was, that was a joke. So now I'll try not to get technical. Uh, it's, it's just so that you all looks up <laughs> at the blackboard. <laughs> so, uh, so some, first some motivation why uh, there should be no information stored on the line. So uh, uh, maybe two remarks. Uh, uh, one remark um, is that uh, for percolation, the uh, pi probability of being, so the dimension of pivotal points, so the dimension of the pivotals, is smaller than one, so it's uh, what is it three quarters? So it's it has to do that with the probability 
to have uh, from some scale to another scale to black arms and to arms of the opposite color. So if you have, let's say, this is size 1 and this is size epsilon, then probability, no matter what is the mesh of the lattice, probability is measured by epsilon to the power 5 quarters. So the dimension of the set of pivotals is 3 quarters. So what happens that if you take a, a line, then uh, basically the probability that you touch a pivotal is 0. Because line has dimension 1, pivotal has dimension 3 quarters, 3 quarters plus 1 is more than 2. So uh, there are two independent sets. So, so if you throw a line on the percolation configuration, it's, there is chance 0 that you hit a pivotal. And vice versa, if you fix a line, there is chance 0 that you'll be there. So this actually has uh, uh, some corollary that you cannot take an arbitrary curve here. If you take curve here, which has dimension bigger than 5 quarters, then there will be pivotals on it, so you are in trouble. So there will be some information stored on the line. So uh, if, if I denote it by alpha, so uh, if uh, Hausdorff dimension of alpha is smaller than 5 quarter, we seem to be OK. And uh, the other remark, it's, it's a sort of, so this, this is uh, uh, sort of this, such sort of uh, arguments, they go back to early work of ADET and covariators uh, on noise sensitivity of percolation, what, uh, how much flipping you can do so that uh, you, do, you, you don't change the crossings. And the second remark is that uh, if uh, percolation is about crossings and uh, uh, we, we look at the crossing. So if we split it into two parts, well, there is, there is another exponent. So if you look at the exponent, the probability that, uh, probability that a cluster touches a given box, uh, so this is an exponent in half plane, then uh, uh, this will be, actually this is comparable, uh, this will be comparable to epsilon to the power one-third. So the dimension, Hausdorff dimension of the cluster intersected with the boundary of d plus, so it's cluster in d plus only, it's equal to two-thirds. So if you have uh, two clusters, uh, two big clusters which touch this from above and below, dimension is two-thirds here, dimension is two-thirds there. And two-thirds plus two-thirds, it's bigger than one. So you have two independent sets of dimension two-thirds. There is a positive chance that they will touch. So it means that if uh, there is a crossing uh, then there is a positive chance that there is a crossing which only once intersects this line. And in this case, if it only once intersects this line, by the first remark, there is no sensitivity. There is, on, on, there is no information stored on the line. You cannot flip this because it's the probability that, that on this line you get pivotals is, is zero. So in, the, in, this, in this case, so there is a positive chance that there is no sensitivity to this line, then you could do this. So this is sort of an easy counting argument. And this is the, actually I want to ask a question, I still don't know that, so that, I did somehow didn't like this question, so that's, I will ask another question which he liked, this is the question which I liked. Is it always true uh, that if you have a crossing, then you always can optimize it so that it intersects the line only finitely many times? So is it true that probability of having a crossing is the same as probability of having a crossing which intersects uh, only finitely many times number of uh, intersections of this crossing, let's say gamma intersect with alpha, is equal, is finite. You want to ask it in the finite realm? It's just... Well, in finite realm you always get a finite number of crossings. <laughs> no, this, uh, this is, yeah, so in finite realm it's the question is whether it is tight and uh, uh, because here I w didn't really specify whether I'm working with a finite realm and uniform estimate, so I, that was implicit, or I work with the scaling limit or subsequential scaling limit. But one, one issue there is may, there may be that in the finite realm you have lots of crossing, but if they're yes, well, yeah, that's very close that's that's that 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 is actually what what is likely to happen that in finite realm you don't you probably won't have a finite number of crossings, but uh, what what you would get is that there are a finite number of groups of infinitesimally close crossings. That's possible. But I, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's, it's kind of a, a zero-one law question is that uh, you have a, an event which has positive probability. So this, does it have the full probability or not? So can you optimize it? Because 
In general, percolation crossing, it has a dimension bigger than one. So if you take the leftmost crossing, it has dimension four thirds, it will intersect this line dimension four thirds minus one, one third. So on the counter set. If you take the shortest crossing, I think there is no physical prediction, but numerical estimates show that it's 1.15. So the shortest crossing will uh, have dimension, intersection of dimension uh, 0.15. But here we want to optimize in a different way, not the shortest, not the leftmost, but the best with respect to this particular line. Can you optimize so that it will have only finitely many crossings? So, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't know, but uh, it's, 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 it's a nice question. And actually, it's, if, if it's true, it will simplify most of what I will be speaking about, and also it will give a sort of much more straightforward con construction of the scaling limit, because it will be very easy to glue the squares together. I would conjecture that it's not true that you have you can't talk well, that's, that's, that's what, what I just said, so it's... Uh, what you conjecture that, that, that you cannot <coughs> get it to be tight. If you fix the line, then... I mean, I would conjecture that it is tight. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you bet? Let's, let's have a vote. <laughs> Democracy. So, so who, 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 who thinks it is not tight? Abstain. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks it is tight? <laughs> Four to one. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's the problem with democracy only. Well, whatever. Fanciest restaurant in Seattle versus fanciest in Paris. I'm sorry? Fanciest restaurant in Seattle. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, let's, let, let, let Bertrand, well, Bertrand will be our representative for this question. <laughs> yes. Do you know there's even a positive probability that you can yes. get from the top and just cross at one point? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, 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 yeah, that's the secondary mark, yes. Yeah, so it's obviously tight. Oh, it's, it's, you know, you, you know, it's sort of the modified law, zero one law, let's say, name it. You can name it after us, so Kumagorov has zero one law about tail sigma algebras, and for all sigma algebras, it's true that any reasonable event has either full measure or zero measure. So this has positive measure, so it has to be full. So it's uh, no, because the other possibility is that uh, you can minimize. Uh, the other possibility is that uh, some capacity kicks in, some complex analysis that you have uh, intersection set which is zero of some capacity, and then it is okay. If it has positive capacity, then it's not okay to glue two things. Because what I'll be speaking about that uh, you can glue two things and determine the configuration. If this would be true, the root for determining configuration would be very easy. You take think above, you take all clusters, all loops, and then you ask whether you can combine this in finite way. So for example, this would be okay. One, two, three, four jumps, and that's it. If, if, if uh, this conjecture is not true, then you, the procedure, if it procedure exists, if there is non-constructive proof. Then constructive procedure would test this, uh, this set of jumps for some sort of capacity criterion, and it would be interesting for a complex analyst, but probably very difficult. You can, you can prove this, that the two sets intersect. Yes, yeah, because there are two independent sets of dimension two-thirds. Well, you need, you need more. You know, yeah. there, are two, there are pairs of independent sets. Of well, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not that, uh, that thick. Yeah, I know that I need more, but I have more. Yeah, that's... that's uh, <laughs> it's, they're, they're sufficiently decorrelated, yeah, so it's... Uh, Mm. Yeah. At least once, once I checked it and it seemed to be okay. I don't know. It's if I, un unless, of course, this is time dependent, uh, this problem then. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, um, so, so, so the thing which, which I will be speaking about, let me maybe start here. So the theorem uh, with the debt is that uh, uh, for scaling limit of percolation, of critical percolation, critical percolation on triangular lattice, or any subsequential limit, subsequential limit on square lattice, Uh, 
uh, you have this property. So the, the sigma algebra in D is the sum of two sigma algebras in D plus and D minus. So it's, uh, and uh, so, uh, well, I mean, strictly speaking, you pro also have to, to add sigma algebra of measure zero sets. So this, this is the, the formula. And um, so, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, so here for my scaling limit, I, I just uh, mean that what we take, we take the sigma algebra of uh, percolation on the lattice, and then we, uh, we take the limit as the limit of sigma algebras. And then uh, after the proof, I'll say a bit uh, how we actually construct it because that will be important for the proof, because in the proof uh, one, one specific way is used. Uh, so uh, the uh, proof uh, one actually ha has, has, has to be careful here, because uh, since we are speaking, uh, if, if, if we do uh, the discrete version, if, if we just sort of try to, to use this estimate to show that uh, there are no uh, pivotals on this line, it works for the discrete version. But since uh, we pass to the continuum limit, uh, there is some trouble there because uh, you might have uh, two different configurations which converge to the same configuration in the continuum limit. So the, for the lattice with mesh epsilon, the distance between them, say, is square root of epsilon, so they get closer and closer. So actually what one has to do, one has to show that uh, if, if you have two configurations, let's say omega 1 and omega 2, so that omega 1 is approximately omega 2 like of alpha, epsilon of alpha, let's say, uh, distance, distance s of alpha. Uh, and then there are like omega 2 is and omega 1 resampled completely independently in neighborhood of alpha. So sort of... Uh, independently resampled near alpha. Then with high probability, with high probability, uh, there is crossing in omega 1 if and only if there is crossing in omega 2. So the, the, the discrete version would be, uh, uh, so there is crossing in omega 1 if and only if in omega 2. Uh, so, so the discrete version would say something like that, that uh, uh, the upper limit as the mesh goes to zero of the percolation measure mu mesh. So this is percolation on, on a grid with a, with a step mesh. And then uh, you take uh, uh, the event that... Uh, let's say, uh, the probability that there is a, let's say, let me formulate it like that, uh, probability uh, that there is a crossing uh, given uh, conditionally on the sigma algebra of uh, f and d minus uh, um, s neighborhood of alpha is between epsilon and min minus epsilon, that this limit is zero. So if, if, you, if you know this sigma algebra, then uh, you would know up to epsilon that the crossing either exists or doesn't exist. So, uh, so here, uh, now, uh, if we prove it, there are, there are two parts one has to do. One has to tackle that we, can, we should resample near alpha, and one has to tackle that we, should, we can move it off of alpha. Uh, and then when this is done, one has to sort of say that, uh, well, this takes care of one crossing event and uh, that these crossing events indeed in a nice sense generate our sigma algebra. So the, uh, there are uh, three problems. So for first perturb, uh, check that this is okay when you perturb of alpha, when you complete step on near alpha, and then say that if you just checked it for one crossing event, it is enough that the collection of all crossing events in a nice way generates the sigma algebra. So uh, maybe, uh, so what uh, do we have? So I, 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 will, I will just sort of uh, go very fast over this and then we'll go 
to the scaling limit. So here there are two parts. Uh, so uh, uh, one, one, one part is, uh, so what, what one does, one introduces another configuration, let's say omega 1 prime. So this is, we just resample near alpha, and this is we perturb a little bit of alpha. So this first part is OK. So the first part is OK by these five quarters estimate. So this goes back to other noise sensitivity papers. So basically what you do, uh, you, uh, so let's say the probability that uh, there is a crossing in omega 1, but not in omega 2. And you take this band of width s around our curve alpha. Uh, so what, what you do, you, you cut it into squares of size s. And you start resampling these squares one by one. So the total number is 1 over s. So it's basically at most 1 over s probability that the same happens when you resample n square. So it's, it's probability, well, let's say there are these you actually go from omega 1 to omega 1, 1, to omega 1, 2, etc., etc., and then you go to omega 1, 1 over s, which is omega 1 prime. So you just start resampling the squares one by one. And what happens if that we resample a few squares, and now we're resampling this, and crossing disappears or reappears? Well, it means that in this square, we would have a pivotal for our configuration. So we'll have a picture like this. So probability that there is a there exists a pivotal in this square, small square Q. And probability of having a pivotal uh, it's s to the power, what was that, five quarters. So it's s to the power one quarter. So as s goes small, this goes to zero. So this is not problematic. And now uh, the second part, if you go from omega 1 prime to omega 2, so now you have two configurations which are same here, but are perturbed. So let's say this is omega 1 and prime, and this is omega 2 prime. They are perturbed off of the line. So now one has to be careful, because uh, if we just do it uh, in a dump way like here, uh, then indeed we can easily kill something, because we can, for example, have a crossing which has a small part here, uh, which is important for the crossing. So it goes, for example, like that. And we perturb it by epsilon, and this part disappears. And there is no uniform bound on epsilon, because it can have arbitrary small ones. Uh, so uh, what, what one does, one fixes another parameter. So let's say there is a width s, and there is a width s prime. and. Uh, then what one does, uh, one takes, uh, uh, well, there are, there are two sigma algebras. There is a sigma algebra f of d minus uh, alpha s. There is sigma algebra of, d of f, uh, f of d minus alpha s prime. So this has less information because you, uh, you take away more things. So it's contained in this. And one introduces another sigma algebra, let's say SS prime, which basically has all the information here. Maybe let's, let me put this in blue. Plus uh, whatever you have parts of the clusters which, which are sticking down from this up to the place where they might touch this boundary. So it doesn't have completely this tree, but it has whatever can be important for us. And with this, one has stability, because uh, uh, if, uh, if s is much smaller than s prime, these things, they, they, they will become, <coughs> you will have good control over them, and they will become stable. Because uh, you, we, we, no longer, we no longer care about such small, such small things. And we no longer care about things. Uh, well, there are two types of things. There are things which don't reach the bottom and things which reach the bottom. So the things which reach the bottom, they are long enough 
So they're stable under epsilon perturbation if epsilon is small enough, if it's smaller than S prime. And the things which don't reach the bottom, we don't care about them. So it's, uh, it's bas basic, basically this thing. So, uh, so in, uh, if S is much smaller than S prime, if, uh, let's say, distance between omega 1 prime and omega 2 is much smaller than S, whatever that means in, in, so, in some sort of metric, then, then there is a stability again by the arms estimates. So uh, now uh, this is basically the idea. This is a short part, but the uh, more interesting part is that uh, one, uh, if one wants to have a proof from that, so what, what, we, uh, what I sort of described here is that you, if you completely know percolation picture here and there, you can reconstruct whether you have a crossing or not with high probability. Now, the question, is this enough to reconstruct the full percolation picture? So if you know all the crossings, is it enough? Well, if you know all the crossings, it's enough. But here, it's like for every crossing we up to epsilon can reconstruct uh, this crossing, and this can accumulate. So you have to have some control over it. And this, this brings to this quote from Adet, which, which also has to do with the definition of percolation limit. So we, we discussed it many times. And uh, so uh, as his quote from his show, so he prefers a, a definition where uh, you already have some limit not assuming anything difficult. So I, in a sense, preferred always that uh, you would, uh, well, for percolation, it's very easy to do something like Russo Seymour well. So you immediately have that crossings are heard primitized curve. So you already have a lot of things. Now, I did, maybe he was looking forward to, to other models, saying that it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's a bad thing to do this. Uh, it's, it's better to have something where you have a limit uh, not, not assuming much. It's, it's more or less the same with constructive Brownian motion. You can, as, you can first prove that the Brownian motion trajectory will be held there continuous and then prove that it exists. And of course, it's easier to prove, but first you have to do some difficult work. Or you can uh, first prove that it exists as a, as a measurable function and then prove that it is actually continuous. So, uh, in, so Adet prefers, prefers this approach. And, uh, so the definition uh, which, which he liked, uh, and I think sort of he was thinking about it long before SLE. Uh, so, uh, okay, so the definition. You take, uh, so in, in a sense, the way percolation model was formulated was uh, the question about crossing rectangles. So you take the space of all rectangles, topological rectangles, and the probabilities of crossing them. So you, you, you take, um, mm, let's say, uh, so I did call them quads. Quad Q is a map from square, a continuous map from a, uh, a continuous map from a square into our domain. So it's continuous now. So you think of such a thing. And now uh, the pergolation configuration, um, mm, so let's say uh, uh, pergolation configuration omega, omega is the set of Q which are crossed, meaning that uh, uh, between two horizontal edges there is, there is a crossing. So, so this works in the discrete setting. And uh, then, of course, percolation measure uh, mu is a probability measure. So mu with some mesh epsilon is a probability measure on, on, the, space, on the space of configurations. Uh, I haven't said what is the topology. And uh, then you, 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 you pass to a limit. Now, uh, so this, this is interesting because we had big arguments about this. So I, 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 my idea was that, again, you should use these properties of smooth, well, not of smoothness, but uh, of continuity, Hölder continuity of crossings. And Adet was saying this, this is an overkill. So he came up with an uh, abstract construction, which was only using the ordering of the quadrangles in the plane. So there is an obvious ordering that if, uh, if I do uh, 
two quadrangles like that, so this is the second one and this is the first, if there is a crossing over first, there will be a crossing over second one. So one can draw more, more interesting examples, so it's, it's uh, the, well, this, this is also a quadrangle, so, it's, uh, so there, 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 are, there, are, there are more intricate things. Uh, but uh, this gives us an order. So uh, uh, you say that, uh, let's say, uh, well, first of all, you define that the space of QD is a Q, a space of all Q with uniform metric. A metric. Uh, and then you define that uh, Q1 is at most Q2 if a crossing Crossing Q1 implies, uh, so let's say, crossing Q2 implies crossing Q1. So here it's on the opposite, so this is Q2, this is Q1. And then you can, uh, since we have this metric, it's uniform metric just uh, of, of the embeddings, uh, we, uh, yeah, there is, there is actually here, I mean, the same quadrangle is given by a few embeddings, so we, we consider them separately. So this, this, uh, uh, gives another slightly better order. Q1 is smaller than Q2. If uh, uh, neighborhood of Q1 is smaller than neighborhood, neighborhood of Q2. So, uh, for example, uh, such thing won't work because you can perturb slightly, so one has crossing and another not, but the original I drawn is, is okay. Uh, and uh, what else? You say that, so I'll just finish with the definition and then I won't prove anything. You say that S in this space of quads, uh, quads is hereditary, uh, su some subset is hereditary if uh, <coughs> uh, if uh, Q inside S and Q prime smaller than Q implies Q prime belongs to S. And this is the property which percolation configuration has, because if you crossed uh, the big quad, then you cross the small quad. Uh, and then HD is the set of uh, S in QD, which are hereditary. And TD is minimal topology generated by, and then there are, one has to construct two, to, to take two, two types of sets. So let's say uh, for open subset U, uh, you take the sets of S such that they don't intersect, uh, don't intersect U, uh, so that intersect U because it's a stable property. If you intersect something open, it's stable. And for closed sets, well, it's enough to take points. Uh, you take uh, such S that, uh, so for points, what should be stable that X doesn't belong to S. And then the, uh, well, this is the space. So HD with TD, uh, well, FD is where percolation lives. So the interesting thing is that indeed we don't, uh, it's, it's a very abstract setting. You, you, you can start, uh, so the way uh, most things are proved about this, that is, for example, it's a compact Hausdorff space. So this proved only using this montanisti property of percolation. So essentially, you start with any topological space uh, which, which has an ordering. You do this construction and it, will, it works. And I remember that, uh, so we're discussing this, and then when I did said first drafts, he, he said that, we expect that the following very general result is well known, but haven't located a reference. So it's, it's again fits in the, in the er, er, earlier comments. And actually, I since tried, I, I, I found one reference. It was in my general topology notes from the university, but I can't find a book. <laughs> so, 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 so maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's some here, say. So now, uh, so this, 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 is, this is how it works. If, if I get into it, it's, it's rather technical. So I wanted then to ask a question, which was a favorite question of Adet and uh, uh, also of myself. So what, uh, yeah, this, this gives you limits and subsequential limits, and then uh, this is enough actually to, 
set up the thing here that uh, um, this is enough to set up things that actually sampling finite number of quads is enough to reconstruct with probability epsilon the whole picture. So it's uh, uh, this, this sort of compactness of this space. And then if you want uh, to show that the percolation, so this gives you subsequential sequent si limits of percolation easily. If you want to show that there is a, uh, there is a unique limit for triangular lattice, then one has to, to run a CLE, branching a CLE, so do something, one has to do something. So this is, one has to do technical work. And we, we didn't know anything which, which would be sort of straightforward. So the nice question is, uh, is what, uh, so where was one question I've written? Yeah, okay, so let me maybe raise the noise from the blackboard. Uh, so how much, much one needs to construct, uh, well, this space and this sigma algebra, so uh, let's say F and percolation measure mu in the space uh, H. Uh, so uh, what, what, what one does for triangular lattice, one uses the property that we have the formula for any given crossing, we have locality, we have monotonicity. So this is the only properties which are used. In principle, you can use uh, some continuity properties too. Uh, they, they simplify the life, uh, some sort of continuity. So the question is whether you can take away the Cardi, the Cardi formula. So if you have uh, some uh, percolation measure in this sense, so there are this measure on crossings of the quads, which has locality property, which has, mon well, monotonicity property makes the, this, this setup working, uh, will, 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 will it, what one needs to ask so that it gives you the critical percolation. Our next speaker is Scott Sheffield, uh, SLE Scaling Limits and the Gaussian Free Field. First, I want to say one thing about Oded in that he was unusual in the uh, extent to which he helped other people solve problems. If you, uh, you know, look at the, you, know, you could maybe divide up, you know, the problems he worked on. There were the problems where he actually co-authored a paper. Then there were problems where he really contributed something very pivotal uh, to someone else's paper. And maybe he didn't want to be a co-author, he didn't want to write it, but he was happy to help with someone other else's paper. And there were, uh, Problems where he, you know, wrote it up in a Mathematica notebook and sent it to people or uh, wrote emails, very detailed arguments. Uh, there were problems that he solved and communicated directly with individuals. There were problems that he uh, and his co-authors totally intended to write up one day, knowing as these things usually go that, you know, other things might end up taking precedence. Uh, and then there were problems that he had no intention of ever writing up, even while solving them, and was just did because they were enjoyable, and uh, and they were people learned something in the process of working on them, and uh, you know even when you go down into layers two, three, four, and five, uh, you know you you find there are things that would be in other people's level one, you know he really had uh, remarkable results at all level, and the uh, um, and. Uh, you know, the published results with his name on them are only a, really a, a small part of, I think, what he accomplished and, and gave to us. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, proving things converge to SLE. So SLE, you know, has now been the topic of uh, several hundred papers um, building on, uh, you know, Oded's uh, early work constructing uh, SLE. And, um, you know, the problem of proving discrete models converge to SLE is just one aspect of that. 
but it's, uh, I, I think, a very important one. And it's one, you know, when people visualize SLE, often what they have in mind are these, you know, these discrete models with scaling limits. And it was a very, uh, I think, a uh, very important part of the, of the field. And um, uh, so, you know, Oded sketched out some uh, ideas in this direction in his, his first paper. And the real uh, hard work uh, was done uh, by Lawler, uh, um, Schramm, Werner, uh, by the three of them in first uh, proving the first scaling limit result for uh, loop erased random walk and, um, and, and uniform spanning tree. And um, so the, the method used in that, uh, in that paper was the same one that was later used in the other papers Oded worked on uh, with, with me on proving things converged to SLE. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and variants of, of this were, uh, were used by Stas as, as well in, in convergence proofs. Um, uh, with, you know, maybe modifications of, of two and three. Um, but the, uh, you know, uh, essential idea is, well, you, you start, you want to prove something converges to SLE, what do you need to do? Well, first of all, you have to say what convergence means. Uh, and you have some discrete paths you can define. And you would like to show that these discrete paths get close to some sort of a, of a continuum random path. Uh, and, and the first thing you need is, is, well, some sort of metric on closeness. And, um, and so the way Oded liked to think was, first, uh, we'll look at the Lovner evolution. And, um, so if I pick a point in the interior of my domain to call the center, we conformally map to a disk, so I have this, this point in the center, uh, then as I draw this path, I can look at the Lovner evolution function, W sub t, that essentially tells me at each time when I conformally map back, what is the image of the tip of the path. And as we all know by now, just knowing W sub t lets you reconstruct the path. And, uh, and so if I have a sequence of discrete paths, Wn, converging to some other path, uh, first thing I might say is, well, this path is close to this one if somehow these functions are close. And, uh, and so the Logan revolution perspective gave him a, a natural metric on the set of paths. Um, you know, these two paths are close if uh, they are, have about the same capacity time. Uh, and if I, you know, the, the endpoints occur about the same capacity time. And if I draw the two paths, the two Lovner evolutions, W sub t's, I find that uh, the supremum distance between them is small. And so that's a definition of close. Paths are close if... In the Lovner sense, he would say, if this is small. Or, or informally, he would say, you know, viewed from this point, uh, these paths are harmonically close together. You can't see the difference between them viewed from this point. Uh, OK. So, uh, so this gives us a, a metric on the set of curves. And the first thing, uh, you might try to do is, is prove, um, well, so this is actually the second thing, step two. You might try to prove uh, that these random paths converge to this one in law, so in distribution, that means weekly, with respect to this particular metric. And, uh, and then once you've done that, you might like to, to strengthen the topology to a more natural metric where you would say, two paths are close to each other if uh, you can parametrize the two in such a way that for all time the, the two paths don't get far from each other. And so Odette sometimes call that the, the, the strong metric 
on, on paths. So you could start by proving convergence in this Lovner driving function metric and then proceed by continue uh, and strengthen the topology and prove convergence in this, this strong sense. Um, But what Odet always felt was the, the most important step was this, this step one, uh, which is what he then used to do step two and three. And uh, step one was just find something about the continuum martingale, or the, the continuum SLE that looks like something in the discrete picture. And this is, you have some martingale, uh, so what would that be? Well, for example, in loop race random walk, it's something uh, involving the Green's function. And, um, and so you have a point, you can look at a Green's function viewed from the tip, and you have some, some function that's varying as the path changes. And if you can show that that function is a martingale for SLE, and it is approximately a martingale for the discrete version, then there's some magical arguments that let you, just from that information, uh, show that the driving functions converge. So I think a, a, a key observation of this, uh, well, more than an observation of this, this lawler schoenberger paper is, is, is this, this principle, that having this, uh, some kind of martingale observable, just uh, this one object lets you uh, then deduce that the driving functions are close. Um, uh, and, and this is a beautiful argument, and um, you know I, I, I don't have time to uh, to really prove it, and would be the wrong person to do it anyway. But I, I will at least show you the paper. So here it is, here it is. The uh, this is the the paper by Lawler, uh, Schramm, and Werner. Uh, this was in uh, Annals of Probability. And um, this was, you know, part of a, a hugely productive string of papers that, uh, in between uh, roughly 99 and 2001 by, uh, by these three authors. And, uh, well, you can at least see from the contents here what you do. You know, you, uh, you define a Lovner evolution, you define the discrete version, and you... Uh, you give some background and you recognize the driving process uh, using these magical tricks and then you uh, strengthen the convergence to a, a stronger topology. And that gets you loop erased random walk being SLE. And a uh, similar thing for the piano curve, uh, the boundary of the uniform spanning tree, first you get the driving function, then you get uniformly continuous, and then you're done. And uh, you need various estimates and okay. I don't know, this, this gives you at least a rough sense what's in the paper. You can all go read it, of course. Um, all right, so, uh, <clears throat> here are a few of the, the SLE scaling limits that uh, one, one should have based on various ideas from, from physics and, uh, and math. So first, uh, Kappa in two and eight, these are, the kappas come in pairs, one being 16 over the other by this duality relationship. So, so two and eight were handled in this original paper. Uh, and um, uh, next thing is, you know, eight thirds and six, which is related to, to self-avoiding walk and, and critical percolation. And um, so, uh, so this uh, self-avoiding walk, well, okay, now, now that you've seen all these, I'll show you my, my, my color-coded version. So, uh, so these are things that, that, are, that are solved, so critical percolation. Um, so this, uh, you know, I guess you say, is, is due to, uh, to Smirnoff. Um, uh, so there was, uh, you know, there were some more detailed arguments for the, the, the latter steps that were given by, by Kamia and Newman. Uh, later on, uh, you know, filling in parts that uh, Stas didn't completely describe. But, you know, Odette always felt that 
once you had step one, the rest was kind of easy, you know, at least, at least for him. And, and he felt that, you know, that, uh, you know, once Stoss had written this, the conformal invariance, that the, the extension of the SLE was essentially done. And he, he re always referred to it that way um, and said that, you know, it's done, that, that proves it. Um, because, you know, he, he knew exactly how to, how to go from there. Um, uh, the, so critical easing cluster boundaries in FK cluster is, is, is work in progress by, by Stas. Um, and uh, this uh, cap equals four, um, harmonic explorer and Gaussian prefield level lines were, were work that uh, uh, I, I did jointly with Stas. And double diner model I put in green because I, Oh, with Oded, that's right. Uh, and double diner model I put in green because I, I, I have a hunch that Rick is going to, uh, to solve this some, someday soon now. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, it, it deserves to be in green, um, I, I think. Okay. Uh, so, Well, before I arrived at Microsoft, I, I, was, I was sending Oded or emails during the summer uh, telling him that I would really like to think about uh, level lines of the, of the Gaussian free field. I thought it was very interesting. I had, uh, doing my thesis with, with Amir, uh, I had worked on random surfaces and I would read some things about the Gaussian free field. And, um, and I knew from talking to uh, Oded and, and Rick earlier that there were there were some connections between the Gaussian free field and there was this conjecture for the double dimer model that, um, uh, that uh, you know, we had talk, Rick, I had talked about with Rick and, and Oded and they had, you know, known about for, for a while, um, which was that, you know, this should look like SLE4. And, um, uh, and again, it was, well, you know, and, and, and the problem, of course, is that we, 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 we could not quite get to the level of, of step one. You know, we had the martingale. In some sense, we had the discrete martingale, but we couldn't estimate it. Uh, couldn't show that it was approximately the continuum martingale. Um, uh, and, but, you know, based on this, I, I was sort of in, emboldened to think that, well, Okay, all I have to do is come up with some model where I can do step one. And Oded has assured me that uh, everything he has done will work and uh, steps two and three will just fall into place. So this sort of freed my mind. I was a little intimidated by steps two and three, so I, I could just focus on, on step one. And, um, uh, and so I, I started to think about uh, this, uh, let's see. Okay, I started to think about this, this harmonic, or this, this Gaussian free field. And I, you know, sent him all kinds of emails during the summer, most of which uh, contained ideas that, you know, were half-baked and wouldn't work, and he would explain to me why, why they, they wouldn't work. You know, some, you know, it seemed like, well, can't you define the level lines of the Gaussian free field right in the continuum? You just, you know, you, you take zero boundary conditions and you, uh, condition on, say, all the level lines hitting the boundary, and you know you've got zero boundary conditions on them too, and so conditioned on that, you, you repeat the process, and somehow this fills up and gives you all the zero level lines. And, um, and you know, and he explained that this, this, this structure just simply cannot be right, because, you know, you're, you're just going to repeat, and everything's going to be zero in the end. And, and, and you know, you know, the expected, uh, you know, like the variance of the average height on a disk like this, and you know that as you're observing these zero level lines, you're, you're learning information and it can't be the conditional expectation is zil, still zero when you're done, no matter what. Um, and so, so there, was, there was clearly something wrong with, with the picture and, uh, um, you know, despite many tries and, and finally, uh, uh, at some point, decided that we had to do something more uh, along the lines of double dimer, make this model look more like the double dimer model, uh, where we understood it. And, uh, 
And we had in mind uh, Stas's argument on the hexagons, and so we thought, well, let's try something with, with hexagons. And, uh, and, so, and that's where we, uh, we came up with this, this harmonic explorer. Um, so I guess I, I, well, no, I guess I, that was next. We, we came up with the, the idea of taking, so let me, Let me, uh, let me first give these references, and then I'll move on with that discussion. So uh, that first reference is uh, Scaling Limits of Loop Race Random Walking Uniform Spining Tree by Schramm, and then next, uh, this Lawler, Schramm, Berner paper. Uh, these two were um, with uh, the scaling limit results that I, I worked on with Oded. Um, this... Uh, is in green because it, it's not finished yet, but it's part two of, of this paper uh, that hopefully will be finished. And this is in green um, because this is a, a joint work that I'm, I'm writing now with, with uh, Nike Sun, which was something that I think uh, it was sort of was started thinking about with Oded to go in this big paper, and it kind of ended up on the chopping block. I think from Oded's perspective, maybe it was in category three or four. Um, you know, he didn't want to want to finish it, but uh, but it was something that you know I I thought was 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 quite nice. And now we're we're trying to uh, Nike and I finish this up, and so I'll um, I'll mention that as we go. So uh, okay, uh, so first of all the. So the discrete Gaussian free field, well, you have a function on a graph. You define an energy, which is proportional to the sum over all edges of the difference in the function between one ed neighbor and one endpoint of the edge and the other squared. That's sort of a, you know, L2 norm of the discrete gradient, if you will. Um, and you define that energy in the discrete Gaussian free field as a random element of the set of functions on the space where the probability is proportional to e to the minus this energy over 2. And uh, because this energy is a quadratic uh, function, this turns out to be a Gaussian uh, distribution for a particular covariance. And um, here's an example of what it looks like if you fix the boundary conditions to be 0 and just look at the, the fluctuations. Um, this is a random Gaussian function. And uh, so we had this idea that if we could just uh, set, take some boundary conditions where we set zero boundary on one side and positive boundary on the other side of some lattice and then we, triangular lattice, and then we uh, color according to the sign of the, um, of the function. So black means the function is negative, white means the function is positive. Um, if we did that, then there would be a, a picture like this where, uh, a dual picture that would look kind of like percolation. And, uh, and so we'd have this natural path, which is sort of an interface between negative on one side and positive on the other. And, uh, you know, so, and somehow it's, you know, it's zero in the middle. So this should be something like a level line of the free field. And, uh, and that's uh, what we did. We also had variants using... Um, uh, if you set the initial boundary heights to be something else, then you get something else besides SLE4. But yeah, the theorem here, we proved if you take these, these magic initial boundary conditions, uh, then the interface converges to SLE4. And, uh, okay, so, and here's a picture of this. We take these boundary conditions, minus lambda one side, plus on the other side. We draw the interface. Uh, here's another view of the function or seen as a function, you can't quite follow the interface, but it's there. Uh, here is the expectation given the values of the in, on the interface. And you see it's roughly constant on one side and constant on the other side. And, uh, and so we realized that if we could prove that this really was roughly one constant on the other side and roughly one constant in the other, um, so we really had this kind of constant height gap between the two sides, then that would be enough to give us the control on the martingale we needed, that would give us step one. And, uh, and this machine that Oded had built would then churn through steps two and three. Um, so, uh, so we, 
So we proceeded to prove what's called the, the height gap lemma. So we went, you know, we use the exact st same steps one, two, and three that were in uh, Lawler, uh, Schramm, and Werner, and uh, but we took this uh, the martingale to be this function, which is the harmonic extension of minus lambda on one side and plus lambda on the other side uh, of the path, and that's something that turned out to be a martingale for continuum SLE and a martingale for approximately a martingale in our case. Okay, so um, and here's a picture of the zero le level lines uh, from the boundary, which was just kind of pretty. We were also able to uh, describe the scaling limit of this. Um, so this paper, uh, you know, I, I started this with Oded in the, in the fall of 2002, um, <clears throat> while finishing my thesis, as I mentioned. And, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, I, kind of a busy time. I had my first child coming in December, and, and this thesis I wanted to get done, but it was, it was really so exciting. Uh, you know, it was, it was like a, a, a drug. Um, I was an addict, you know, coming uh, to work on this. And, um, and kind of by, uh, <coughs> you know, February, uh, March of 2003, we sort of had convinced ourselves it was going to work. And, uh, and so we came up with this sort of fair distribution. I said, look, I'm still intimidated by this, uh, these steps two and three. I'll just do step one, and you write up steps two and three, and we'll, we'll divide it up that way. Um, uh, and, it, you know, it turned out that step one was more challenging than I'd anticipated. That ended up being the, the core of the paper, and 80 pages, and highly technical, and uh, at some point I did have to, you know, return for, for assistance. Uh, and uh, you know it was you know very uh, a collaborative effort finishing the um, that uh, that that step one which was very but but very enjoyable. Um, I, I want to show you some emails from uh, just while we were finally finishing up step three in in two thousand six. Uh, so three years later, uh, after many distractions, including other joint papers with each other, we mm. wrote, ended up somewhere between six and eight joint papers together, depending whether you count the ones that have not appeared yet. Um, uh, but, so, you know, these are fairly mundane emails as we, we, we go through and, uh, and try to decide how we're going to handle this step three. You know, what are we going to do? You see Rick and Stas's name here. See, oh, you missed it, Stas. You should have been looking up. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I uh, hope you all can follow this. Um, you know, at some point, we decided we would leave out the identification of lambda till the second paper, which it is. That second paper is still pending, but uh, should come out soon. Oded says we can uh, decide to say a few words as a trailer about how it is done in the next movie, I mean paper. Um, uh, Uh, at some point, he, uh, you know, came up with his own version of the topology improvement. Um, and uh, so it's, at some point, we sort of had competing versions of this, this lemma. And, um, well, we ended up going with his version. But uh, the problem was we wanted to prove this convergence also when you have... Uh, other boundary conditions. Um, so, you know, not just plus and minus lambda, but some other boundary conditions. And in that case, it turns out the path hits the boundary. And, uh, and the step three actually became very subtle in that case. And it was supposed to be the easy case, but it, you know, we had to do a lot of work um, uh, to, to prove it. And um, we ended up giving up and deciding we would not prove it for the boundary hitting case. We would only prove, we would prove convergence in the strong sense for the, the general case. And for the boundary hitting case, we would only prove convergence in the driving function metric. And um, so let's see if I can get this to show. Uh, 
some of these discussions. So, you know, I plan to do everything in another paper, but he said this would take a long time. Maybe we should make the topology upgrade pending some modular result. I'm not so fearful of using our other technology and doing this all directly. Um, you know, our later results will have to rely in some sense on these earlier papers. But I think our primary goal should be to release a clean paper proving the contours in at least one form converged to SLE4. If we want, we can also refrain from submitting it before we are happy that it fits well with the rest of our plans. Because you can be stated explicitly in the introduction. Um, and uh, now we went you know, back and forth on this. I, mean, I have about 15 pages of emails, which is just sort of you know, these mundane sci deciding what we're going to do, how much we're going to prove, and what we're going to leave out. And exactly, you know, the paper already ended up being 130 pages. And you know, what, what are we going to cut out? Um, at some point, uh, you know, I gave in and decided we wouldn't do the most general powerful part, but do the part we could actually finish. Um, and, you know, I've read over your version. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's shorter, especially since some of the results will be needed as preliminaries of mine anyway, but it's less general. There's a trade-off, as we knew, between how much we can gain and how much we'd be gained by having a more general and more modular proof. Of course, we can pledge to include a more general modular proof in a later paper which may even be better in that uh, the idea would get more intention that way, but the utility has to be discounted based on, well, dot, dot, dot. So I rambled on for some time. Uh, based on the distribution of the amount of time to completion, the discount interest rate. OK, uh, probability it will never get finished, et cetera. Uh, we, of course, can make reasonable arguments both ways. And uh, Oded's response to this was very terse. Um, he just uh, wrote, right, since the more specific DGFR seems to essentially finish the shorter, let's go with that. And um, view it enough to feel comfortable. And I said, well, OK. <laughs> so, so we went with that. But, um, but the longer argument is, uh, is now something that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm working on with, with, with Nike. And uh, say, this is an excellent young student you should all get to know, Nike son, who's just starting. Uh, she just finished at Harvard and is starting uh, her PhD program um, at, at Stanford. She's been working with Amir over the summer, and she's going to spend a year in, in Cambridge. Um, uh, but you know, what was it? the essential thing we're, we're working on, which ended up on the, the chopping block of the work with Oded, is to say that, is it possible that just knowing the Loebner driving convergence is actually enough? Yes? OK, all right. So I'm well, OK, I'm almost out of time, yes. So I'll, I'll give a quick uh, description of this. So um, uh, so, so first of all, there, there, there are these known examples where you can have paths <coughs> that kind of it goes up and down and then back inside itself. So this is a, a, a continuous simple path, but it's sort of w wobbling up and down like this in such a way that uh, it looks re really close to a straight line in the Lovner sense. And yet, in the strong topology sense, it's very not close. It's wobbling all over the place. And uh, so, uh, so what we noted with, with Odette is that, well, if in fact you knew that you had Lovner driving function convergence for both directions, going forward and backward, then you could rule out this sort of funny business. Um, because even though the, Lo the Lovner driving function in the forward direction of this looks normal, in the backward direction it, it doesn't. Um, uh, and um, and it turns out there, there is something similar that holds Although the story gets quickly more complicated, but there's something very similar that holds for, uh, for non-simple SLEs, which is essentially that if you can show that for a generic point, um, your path converges to SLE, no matter which direction you parametrize it in, 
with respect to the, uh, the Lovner uh, driving function metric, this automatically implies that the whole path converges in the strong sense. Um, so in fact, all you need is step one and two. Um, once you've written a 30-page paper uh, giving this general result. But basically now, it's, once you have step one and two, uh, three follows automatically. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Well, okay, maybe I should uh, thank again the organizers and uh, Oded and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a part of this and I think, you know, I, I've often wondered if you, you could do an experiment, what would happen if Oded had just finished his first paper on SLE and had left the rest of us to work this out on our own? How, how long would it have taken us? What would we have achieved? Um, I mean, it, it certainly would have been, even with all of us in this room, I think a lot harder. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately now in some sense we're getting to play out that experiment uh, since we have to go on without him uh, for the next 10 years. But, uh, you know, we're fortunate to have had him with us and uh, we're fortunate to have been part of this conference. So thanks to everyone.